Poetics for the more, I just got back into town. So Poetics for the More Than Human World, uh, which is the Dispatches issue, which is now becoming a print anthology uh, from Spoit and Dival Press. And um, Spite and Dival Press. And I just wanted to say that we were looking for um, a kind of new approach to eco-poetics or to eco-poetry through eco-poetics that would concentrate on, on sort of expanding the notion or even eliminating the notion in some cases of the I, the central I, uh, who would be the narrator and the kind of perspective of, of, the, of, of the poem. So I'll be introducing um, the poets today and, uh, and then I will just withdraw and uh, after, each, uh, after each poet is read, you'll hear me again. So the first uh, poet we have today for our reading is Tessie Etsiti. Oh, sorry, I thought I was second to last on the list. It doesn't make any difference, Bernie, but in fact, um, the order is different, but do what we can oh. do, alphabetical oh. will be fine too. Okay, because I just had the list that was sent before I left town. Take it away, Casey. Okay, start my time. Yat eshe sani edel inadesha jine, senna ha bithina shlant, kotna sathni bashish chin, kaba hedesha tero hashkaha tsara shanale. A kotao, dine, a san nishle. So my name is Sani edel ine. Um, it means she who is like old women in English. I publish under Tacey. And um, I'm from the Navajo Nation. I'm going to start with a poem from my book, Rain Scald, um, from the University of New Mexico Press. And it's the title poem, which is Rain Scald. When standing in rain for so long, you no longer hear or feel it falling. You believe it's stopped. Step away, look to your skin, muck itch. It's a shame your hands have gone bald from fungus, taking you to what's beneath scab, to one of those nights when you know your gums will bleed. To say it's been a while or it has to do with wrist mange is to say rot comes so easily now, skin weep. Laps, step through the whole black of your home and still no damp, no exactly when to bend your finger for the light switch. So familiar in a bod, shame, your hands have gone haywire, taking you to what's beneath rust, ranges they've grazed, a time when you're combed through when you know your knuckles and all that rain has swallowed. So this next poem I'm going to read is in the, the new anthology, the Norton Anthology. Some of you might have heard of it. When the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. And so this is on pre-order right now, um, uh, a Norton Anthology of Native Nations, and it was edited by Joy Harjo and a whole bunch of us helped her out. So. Sonnet for my wrist. I tend to mistake your ribs for a hand towel. It hangs on a nail above the wash bowl, the hand towel ripped. There's something wearing about the end curve of thread. When I sleep, I keep my palms open. Verve, we were lovers in a field of gray. In Navajo, we say something wrote. All radical when you hurt me something close. Even you waft. It's best I tether. Forget flyaways I plucked. My bones, they lie to me like fray, like gaunt. I don't crawl back for fragments, even a spinal cord of sinew. It's not going to close. You rope me from stray to grip. It's all for naught. I'm born for my father, Tangle people. Our mouths and webs, tonight, my wrists part, and you chase my insides until they dangle into pieces. And then the two pieces that were in 
the sequel poetics three and it's from a sonnet redoubled called lacing and this is three tonight i'm going to show him how i got good at petitioning for rain how i came to handle drowning and how i came to turn away from candlelight because the flicker simply overwhelmed me could I, in his absence, pass my hands over limbs of wood tonight? Though we're walking in years between us, a candle brings us a cloud closer to a deeper hue, and we can handle any breeze that turns us inside out. I leave on my hood, afraid I'll forget I changed, forget his whirl if he were rain, I'd quit him before he even fell. I was taught not to run when it finally came, but to take it all in. I couldn't. It's the way my hands and face whirl off like utterance in the wind, and my drowning quells like rain off the leaf of a boy's flower or muscle ache. Nine. There I was, all spread out for the taking. Bloomed wings waiting for winter sleet. It was a long season of drinking whole creeks and nothing else. We turned desert into desert. What I'm saying is neither the desert rat nor damselfly can bear the nosebleeds. Shoal, laced, laced face bearing down just in time to overwinter. There I was, all spread out for the taking. In truth, nobody wants water this thin. One swallow, and we're off to dig for more within a womb hollow. This morning, we sip water, discussing the trauma in our blood. Salt water. There it rests in droplets on my breast skin. Oh, I say, my tears, rubbing them deep within. 12. The lace hem of my skirt has become worn. Or maybe it's always been this way. Like wind, we never felt the cracks of morn that summer. I told him I'd turn them, wind them even, if he wanted me to, until he'd think I was making music. Sometimes when I bind them, they can be tuned beautiful still. Just a wink. And I'll come, bear, I'll come wearing mountains over my shoulders, come bearing lakes about my legs. Then, in a blink, we'll tune ourselves to a field of lace, our shoulder blades thrusting into the white, and our wrists, they'll finally, they'll finish going round, ready to shoulder the day we yellow together into old lace, old wrists our lives rounded out like arcs of our wrists. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tacey. Um, next reader is John Brantley. Okay, I just unmuted, so I hope you can hear me. We can hear you, yes. Okay, uh, I wanna thank Cole and Bernie and Mary for helping to organize this and everybody for being here. I'm going to start with a short poem, and this is going to be in the Eco Anthology, Once and Always. A stray galaxy settled in the voice box. Bits of charred star in everything we say. This poem is called Use Only as Directed. When thousands of fires in the Amazon burn and you hear a mannequin in the oven saying, heart, don't stop, keep beating. When a turtle on its back in the river, unable to right itself says, tragedy is what happens to me. Comedy is what happens to you. In a lab in San Francisco, a monkey with COVID-19 says, Overhead, the green angels mutter. Overhead, the green angels mutter. When your spleen found on a mattress 
off the coast of Greenland says, friend, the moon is not biscuit, nor blister, nor nailhead, but elementary verb. When a coyote napping on a floating nuclear reactor in the Russian Arctic yawns and says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. When a driver uses her key to pry a morning dove out of the grill of her GMC Yukon, and the bird cadaver says, the loudest noise in the world is silence. When you call the FBI and request they perform a wellness check on the planet, and the spokesperson tells you, hey, dude, the brain is wider than the sky. When bouts of heart palpitations and shortness of breath lead to spinal injections of Gregorian chant and Bach cello suites, repeat as needed, ah, nirvana amoeba, amoeba nirvana. That poem uses a number of quotes from other people, and I normally do not do that. Um, the poem felt like it wanted to pass on <laughs> certain passages from other writers. So Heart Don't Stop Keep Beating is Rocco Scotolaro, an Italian poet. Tragedy is What Happens is Mel Brooks. Um, overhead, the Green Angels Mutter is a, a little known poet who should be known more, Max Ritvo. And The Loudest Noise is Thelonious Monk. The Brain is Wider is Emily Dickinson. Okay, I have one more poem. This is a short one uh, inspired by COVID, looking over our shoulder always. And I think the pandemic is clearly connected to what we're doing to the environment. That taste on the tongue. I revel in that taste. The delectable, reckless ripeness of a wild black raspberry. Or is it? the relentless ripeness of my own flesh. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, and our next reader is Lainey Brown. Are you there, Lainey? Hello. Can everyone hear me all right? Yes? Okay, great. Um, thank you all. I'm so happy to be with you and grateful for this anthology. Um, I'm going to read from a manuscript called Practice Has No Sequel, and excerpts from this manuscript are in the anthology, um, but I'm reading different work from, from the manuscript. And I'm going to be reading from a poem in that book, that's called Ceremonies for Words. The unknowable is pebbly light we did not expect, could not describe between finite and ocean, each singular breath step sewn to the next nested string of pulsations. Close your eyes and you are everywhere. Inhale, stitch, exhale, cry, interwoven. Solitude inscribes ribs and brow. Dawn, bird, puddle. Lucid mud molds, uncatching, no self, no fortress, under netting unseen, names re return, recite each syllable, home, hidden, born. Unmake, bills, webs, beds, plan, Memory, party, parting. Script entrances to immutable, coupled with rivulets. 
yarn. Recall the resin sun placed at your neck. Escort books, sweep schedules, reconfigure windows and trees, doors, reason, wicks, counters. Fill lamps with incantations. Not all in one day. Walk to mailbox where guarded cards escort viscous light. So what if rooms glow into? I glued myself on paper and went out. How to drown water, draw silence, darn flame. How to sever darkness, walk into bones, one's own body. How to stay, scatter perforations, unpin. How to comb a numb passage. Carve sunsets of pink salt crystal, seeing flocks of sideways touch. Fine broken figments in rows, a torn rudimentary glistening, no postcard resists, not even paper revels. Only the trees were truthful. A lighted window was just a picture. Why wish for an unblemished frame to stop thought or absolute silence? As soon as to recover, more able is to offer leaf and fable Berries brought home to draw, though I did not draw them. The day escaped as I was dutifully preparing ceremonies for words. Soon I heard, our time is drawing to a close, or our time is close, not closing here in the mouth. Subtle chain of now has no spelling. No discernible meter, once verse, once bird, steps anchored, tiny flame pierces in step, crystal inset flame centers, follows red fox weather in a frame against snow, in a gallery, in labyrinth dusk, however she appears. Now is you already. Send the message and return to the passage. I went to the well, went up twice, once to a place, hand written, and another to say, I am going, as in the life of any letter, instruments. Alphabets strung of demitas, adagios, until place bursts. Shall I go now or pause to say waiting, curtsied, going out? What does it look like waiting, curtsying, and if I do go again in diaphanous waves, in the myriad ways? Tears do not oppose stars, which meters blind, yet is nothing, and there is no place. Where does edge open? Inside a shimmering white cylinder, I sit as a small girl and attempt to hold both grandmothers on my lap. Pathways to middle body require the cessation of analyzing this image from my window, a fluttering in frontal sight, a perch where wingspan, spacious, quiet. 
Thanks, you. Our next reader, thank you. Thank you, Lainey. Our next reader is uh, Brenda Coltos. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yeah, great. A gaze. One, a man takes a photograph of his meal, but to who? Himself or others? Others, too, texting in a crowd on First Avenue as glaciers recede? They do not feel the fading cold of the ice, only the heat of the keystrokes. At the top of a mountain where only small mammals live, the air is thin and gives me panic. I do not belong above the tree line, even though I can drive there. At times I forget that I'm not an extension of the machine until I have my palms, until my palms hurt my palms touching a hot metal pot recoil and remember to use hot pads to protect the flesh fabric that covers the hand bones. From the glacier tops bodies of mountain climbers in the dead zone, where their corpses sweeten or embitter the waters of the Ganges, the leather shoes of the Iceman text forward. Sometimes a tap runs while I brush my teeth and empty backwater down the drain. The last glass of water sets before you, how fast or slow and where will you drink it? We load the car on Highway 50, the loneliest highway in the USA. It winds through Nevada, crossing the Pony Express, Express route and ancient seabeds. Last glass of glacier water boils in the kettle. Saffron threads of a Viking beard cloud the water glass. Theft of water, relocation, Diverted from its bed, hydrofracking, I never thought they'd use our water against us. When we began with this full jug of water without thinking until the police chased us away from the creek of who owns the water or that satellite overhead branded by a private owner over public space. Wanted to absorb it, to get to the bottom and start all over again a great anxiety about finishing and throwing it away with an inch still in the bottom, the backwash. Who owns the creeks and waterways of this valley? The only legal course is midstream so that anglers can trout fish without trespass. Into the last glass I stir reindeer scat with a herding stick captured from the thaw. The water, sometimes they use it against us. I question the interaction between the synthetic, the plastic, and the real inside of the jug on the table. The water is an hourglass, and I write as fast as I can before it runs dry. A glass of water from the last glacier sets before you on the table. You gaze at the logo of an abundant flowing stream or the name of the spring, which somehow sounds pure and far away as an iceberg, calved off and lassoed from the warming world, even though you know the source is a corporate tap of public water. Fertilizer runoff into our family well. I used to picture a whale, a Moby Dick under the cornfield, a Leviathan as a source of our water, because only a vessel the size of a sperm well could contain the water that flowed on command from the tap, even though people spoke of the well running dry, ours magically replenished itself under the blanket um, of Monsanto crops. The last glass of water sets before you. Will you drink it slowly, savoring the taste of the glacier? It flows on the green logo and facsimile of a mountain stream of abundant water, abundant a 20th century word. Natural is highlighted and yellow in a yellow circle, it is written, contains 16 servings, and there are only two of us left since this now nearly empty jug was opened. Two. We might have swam to our seats in the crystal underground cavern or inside of the whale. The water table is a banquet of the Last Supper, the clear plates as detailed as a sea monkey's anatomy 
are the vulvas of Judy Chicago's dinner party. A centerpiece of lilies welcomes us. A waiter comes with his crystal water pitcher wrapped in white linen. He bows and we watch the glasses turn a cool blue antifreeze shade. Some harvest and sell the rights to rain. Although the water said clear and running and cool and unstoppable glacier tops of blue stones and blue stones and slick rock and kill is Dutch for spring. We've arrived at this point where a water source has become diamond worthy. The vision withstands the weight of platters laden heavily with fruit and bread. Gazing at water through glass prisms, champagne with hollow stems, Turkish tea blue and silver panels, crystal flute and jelly jar, coil pot, Roman goblet, ancient clay fragments of a water jug, banana leaves, cupped palms, water rush, flow of public and private, locked website or paywall. We sit down before the guards can catch us. Who deserves the right, the water, or the rights to a stream or river bank? Wastewater, its breath of chemicals pass through the tablecloth and infect it with radiant breath. Inside pantry doors mining deep into the cabinet, the heavy minerals are stored in the far reaches of the cupboard and on the top shelf out of reach. Who holds the crystal clear machine guns? Who fires the shocks of the invisible fence? We gaze at the fence of ownership, once set for us, then set against us. Taking shelter in the watershed, I thought this is untouchable, such a treasure, cat skills pure. Taking shelter in a house that once set in a place now underwater, a house meant to be drowned under the Ashokan Reservoir. I sit in a dry chair before the wood burner. Theft of water from Bishop Falls, greatest heist of all, heist of all, starts the flow downstream. Marcella's shell sounds gendered and plentiful like Roberta tar, tar sands. Shell and airs, farmers made wealthy overnight. Drinking in the morning dust of the evening air, of last evening's air. They use private forces against us. Water weapons to keep us away from our water. Thank you. Thank you. Um Brenda, and our next reader is James McCorkle. Thank you. Um, I'm going to use uh, screen sharing, so I hope I can do this correctly. Can everyone hear me okay? Can everyone hear me okay? I guess I'll, I'll forego the the, uh, the uh, screen share on, uh, until afterwards if there's time. Um, I want to thank uh, Cole and Charles for the series. Um, I want to thank you, Mary, Sarah, and Bernard for the anthology, and thank everyone for being here. I'm going to read um, from uh, part of the uh, text I have in the anthology titled Locations, Echolocations. And um, this is uh, in part uh, a collaboration with uh, my colleague Gabriella D'Angelo, uh, who is an artist and colleague of mine, examining um, surveillance, ecologies, and borders. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I'm reading here on the traditional land of the Haudenosaunee people on Lake Seneca. And literally across from me is a site where enslaved Africans were quartered. And uh, the glacier carved uh, finger lakes are described by the first peoples as the handprint of the divine. So again, I'm reading an excerpt um, that uh, 
is in the anthology Locations and Echolocations. Choya thickets, staghorn, silver, cane, warning, undia caminado, dos dias caminado, tres dias caminado. You won't reach three points from the border by then following 286 north through Buenos Aires. Look for the femurs and tibias, the unknown, unidentified, the, remote, the remains mummified. If I were here, the apparitions of each, the 3,000 found would pass each a desert sparrow in the higher ranges. Crossing the border through the desert is dangerous and will end in death. How many kilometers can you walk before you hallucinate? Your mouth sucks at the air, the air drying out, the inside of your body as the sun crisps your skin. The wind, a cloud of thorns, light jumping choyas. Every step across the Sonora is across your own fragility. In June, the sunset red fruit, hearts packed with seed of saguaro, burst, hearts burst, heart break, heart broken. These are the remains of the organ pipe, the rare on the north side, Sinita, horsetail, spurge, okitio, bittersweet, for three days of walking, you will need six pairs of socks, salt boils, and blisters rubbed to the bone, blistering, wet, blood wet. In three days of walking, stop, walk, wait. Your guide will tell you if you don't move, man, you've got to move. If you don't move, you're left behind. Bellflower, honeysuckle, bean, and if, dearest brother, dearest sister, daughter, loving son, if we get there, what is there? When was the last gray wolf heard in the Baba Quivari Mountains, seen a masked bob white, a lesser long nosed bat, calliope hummingbird, listening in the sycamore creek, valley, cottonwoods, jaguar, and green kingfisher, errant, strain? across Cotamundis and gray hawks, vermilion flycatchers in the riparian areas. The desert is not a singularity. On the map, each red dot is a site of remains found, a body discovered. In this area, the red dots converge, blacken until you take and spread your fingers, zooming down granular. Two million year old volcanic rocks create soils in Brown Canyon, unlike elsewhere. How long does the body broken down to its bits of bone and sinew, broken down past what pass through the guts of ants or rodents to be wrapped around seed or egg? How long does the body last in all its incarnations? particle recombination of the everlasting, the remaining. If I were here, the soil where I have been, Benitez, Aldeco, Daniel, male, 26, 2018, 11, 02, 31.81 by 109.72, private, land, blunt force injuries of the head and torso fully fleshed, unidentified, undetermined, 28, 2018, 1231, 32.27 by 112.85, Bureau of Land Management, undetermined, complete skeletization with bone degradation. I'm thinking of my laptop, any electronic memory receptive device as the new archive, a new memorial, immaterial, retrieving each of these remains, coordinates to guide us there to that spot, spillage place of sinew and bone. Scoop the sand, soil, silica, remains the strands of DNA of you, your name or not name but last place of residence, residing, subsistence, though what little that remains gathered and buried, what was now part, always parting of bird, wolf, fox, bee, being. There are no borders. Location swims across the sand, walks on water. 
Hosanna, Hosanna. Thank you. Thank you, James. And our next reader is Linda Russo. Hi, um, I'm going to read from um, a work, an ongoing work that I'm sort of playfully calling uh, Creco Poetics. Um, so about 100 yards down the hill from me, I can walk to an urban uh, creek that's now part of the urban infrastructure here, but it daylights uh, half a mile in um, either direction, up and down stream. And so it's been an almost daily writing companion for me. Um, the creeks where I live um, are tributaries of the Pluse River, which um, drains into the Snake River, which drains into the Columbia River, which goes to the um, Pacific Ocean. So this creek I've uh, been writing with is called Dry Fork Creek. Uh, we are located on the traditional homelands of the Nimipu tribe and the Palutes Band of Indigenous People in the area now known as Eastern Washington State. And um, I'm going to um, share my screen, uh, start a video, and read. Uh, this is a piece made of remnants of animal fat. Creek invites me to witness the capacity. It is not a mirror of my meanings, but a dream of meaningful life, and I fall in. Beneath this loose thatch of grasses, naturalizing my ear to the sound of water breaking, over rocks of this place to gather its living mineral meaning. This new path whose grasses lie down beneath a fast food container. Here the path comes to an end or the animal continues. My belated footprint flattened lengths of grasses. This branch bears marks of teeth work. This branch broken as if by hand. Why should she make this other path except that I should follow and find a small dirtied toy foam dart at the end of our arrow-like doctrine of discovery? What kind of house do you want to live in? It is useless to pause and ask of this life, how did we get here? I did not arrive with the purple asters native to this land. What does one say when they enter this part of the ceremony that announces itself as already running water? Political relation. On this trail, you will encounter political relation. Someone has secured a plank to either bank to span the creek and a stairway of four by fours wedged into the slope beside a rope anchored at the top near the trail, create a footpath to the post office that avoids the busy road. This path is meant to enter your dreams. The sound of the creek, a constant relation Now I must say a few words about recent US American environmental legislation as it pertains to water. In name, water rules, since the Clean Water Act of 1972. And specifically, we will pay attention to the defining and redefining of entities and the communities for which they hold space regarding their status as waters of the United States, so-called, and how this pertains to the legal protections granted to waters. To be clear, this is not a rights of nature issue, but we remain in the era of the land grab and its concomitants, habitat fragmentation, water pollution, and ecocidal cultural destruction. 
until quite recently, roughly 60% of waterways, including streams, ephemeral waterways, and wetlands that connect to larger waterways were protected as so-called waters of the United States. And very recently, this connection was no longer sufficient to maintain your status as waters of the United States. Now you must be navigable to be among the entities set aside for protection as waters of the United States. Here are two poems I wrote for you, having reflected on these developments. Waters of the United States. Are you navigable? Are you waters of the United States or sovereign waters? When I am born, you are not yet waters of the United States. And there is no way to limit the harm we can inflict on you. Now the clock is turned back to 1972 and I have been born and you are now waters of the United States and we must protect you, but we are limited in ways we can do so. As a citizen of the United Waters, will you protect me? As a sovereign, do you desire the protection of the United States of Waters? We navigate each other, aligning chemical states, every atom belonging. on these ephemeral waters. Words falling in like stars on water bugs skimming the water, tiny hairs on slender legs spreading, on water shimmering like stars, crowns of willow trees shimmer, reflecting my crowning. Words falling from our mouths like stars, tiny hairs on slender legs spreading, on water shimmering like stars, crowns of willow trees shimmer, reflecting my crown, words falling from our mouths like stars. We are waters of the United States of waters. We meet seeking refuge within these porous borders. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Our last reader for today is Keith Tuma. All right, thank you very much for publishing my poem in this anthology. I'm going to read a set of poems from a manuscript in progress called Studies in the Unnatural World. They're all prose poems. I'll read the one uh, that's in the anthology first. There are a number of them coming out in Silver Pinion, some in the Laurel Review, in the webzine out of uh, the UK, Data Bleed zine a few days ago, a few other places. This one's called Audiology. At dinner with the visiting translators, I hear about the girlfriend of the poetry translator and her commitment to rescuing animals. A dog missing its front legs and soon to be fitted for a cart a feral Italian kitten smuggled into the country via Montreal, a dozen parrots. Parrots often outlive their humans, the poetry translator says, and his girlfriend's adopted birds speak the history of their city. One pipes up with Juanita and coughs forcefully as if to remember a marriage ended by emphysema or a crotchety old man yelling for his nurse. Another says, I need a drink and turn on the ice machine. Another sings, jiggle the handle, suggesting the location of its cage in its former life. And so on, expressions of intimacy and love compete with curses to map the range of human emotions among deceased parrot lovers. Some parrots parrot other birds, so the house is a conference of birds, the poetry translator says. One evening he had an edible and endured the mimicry for hours in that altered state. The other translators laugh at the thought, they have told their stories about the trials of translation to an assembled student audience. Their work is done. Now among peers and hosts, they are freer in their speech. Never tell a story that good to a fiction writer. 
the translator of fiction says to the translator of poetry. Twelve parrots and an edible. This is called Dendrology for my daughter Allison. It's a mush of melting snow in the backyard under the trees. I'm waiting for the little dog Moose to smell what he wants to smell and do his business, as some call it. He's lost in discovery. Our two white pines, twins almost, and the oak and tulip tree loom tall and ancient, older than the house, older than me. It's dark and quiet, and I have nothing that needs doing, though I want moose to be done so I can get out of the cold. After a week of sub-zero temperatures, branches litter the ground, waiting for a warmer day to be gathered and tossed into the woodpile I've established among the honeysuckle that forms a natural border at the back of the lot, hiding the stone house that once was the farmhouse for this land. Between our lot and that house, there is this natural border, we say, as if there were such a thing. We mean anything other than a fence. As Moose noses around, I happen to look up in time to see a black branch falling from the tulip tree. These trees aren't only old, I think, they're falling apart. It's dangerous to be under them. The branch hits the thawing turf with a thud. Then I see that it's not a branch, but a squirrel. That's a first, I think. I'm too old to believe in a natural world, but it's harder to give up on talent. It takes the squirrel a second to get up and run back to the tree. Oncology. The oncology nurse likes to talk about everyday life. Traffic this morning during her commute to the city. Plans for a holiday still a few months away. Her daughter's decision to quit college and move in with friends in a tiny North End apartment. Who is paying for that? The oncology nurse is friendly. But this is her professional talk. She's killing time for the young woman waiting for chemotherapy. The drugs must be made up and bagged on the morning of the infusions. Pharmacists must wait on white blood cell counts to get the go-ahead. The oncology nurse acts as if she has all the time in the world. The young woman's father has come from far away, her boyfriend too. They've driven across town to buy dry ice to freeze the blue turban the young woman will wrap around her head to keep her hair from falling out. Would you like some crackers, the oncology nurse asks. This first one will take 40 minutes, she says, and names the drug. The young woman knows it already. The steroids will keep you strong, more energetic than usual for a day or two. The oncology nurse reminds the young woman that she'll need to flush her toilet twice if others are staying in her apartment. If she has a high fever, she has to come back to the hospital. She's seen the blue turban before, yes. Astrology. I am not a New York poet. I meet my old friends at a poetry reading in Portland, Oregon, and we agree to get drinks after and wind up at a Tony rooftop bar not far from the bookstore. The weather is perfect. The first hint of summer, bright sun and a light breeze. So Donald Bartholomew says, don't describe the weather. Martini weather then. We are lucky to get a table. My daughter and her boyfriend are in town and come along to meet my poetry friends. One of them tells us about traveling to Switzerland for the assisted suicide of his father, who was in the early stages of Alzheimer's. I'd last, I'd last heard about his father in a text my friend sent as I was headed home from Boston after visiting my daughter in a time of illness for her. I'm feeling lucky that she's in good health. My friend tells of depositing his father's ashes in the Atlantic before coming back to the States. How intelligent, I think. How responsible and brave. And then he tells us about riding his mountain bike on a trail near his home in Olympia, Washington, and coming around a bend to meet a mountain lion. This explains the sling on one arm. There is nothing to learn from the stars. Ichthyology. I like fish that eat other fish, the man at the next table says. Sockeye, not the farm raised. The man and woman who are his dinner companions nod. I get my hair done down the way, the woman says, and asks the older gentleman to see how it went with his hip and knee replacements. It's been two years, she says, and then, you know me with antiques and stuff. To be sure it's a restaurant full of them, an old house. He's doing well, says the man, in a suit and wireframe spectacles he puts on to eyeball the label on a can of microbrew he's been delivered. I want to enter the conversation to say that farm-raised salmon are fed ground-up fish and fish waste with soy to help them grow, but I'm sure they won't appreciate the footnote. What's the big deal about swimming, free swimming anyway? The mercury doesn't kill you, the microplastics will. Besides, algae's not on the menu, and there's lots of hot sauce. 
on my shrimp. All right, I'll do uh, just uh, one more. This is called Virology. Uh, Philip Gustin, The Code 2, it's an epigraph. Among the upper crust and old Hangzhou, it was customary to brew seven varieties of tea at the beginning of summer, a different tea for each of the three houses on one's right, three more for the houses on the left. The last was for the household, presumably. The last was for the household, presumably. Tea was served in porcelain bowls, but only enough for a single sip. The closest I've come to that kind of community building ritual was passing a joint among friends. You don't take an extra hit without being called out for bogarting. That was forever ago, though, before the community was community spread. No doubt the tea ritual is toast, too. Is it, in, is it inevitable that many of us will soon be shells of what we used to be? If so, this painting could be printed as our flag, this empty coat handlessly holding its matching pants and shoes, awkwardly upstanding on blood red turf. It has too many buttons. There's nobody to wear it, no place to go. Behind it is a baby blue sky, chalky clouds. The dead are dead. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Uh, thank, uh, again, all the readers, and I hope you will stick around for the discussion. Okay. Um, maybe, too, uh, we'll announce the readers for next week. Um, I also wanted to remind everybody that I've turned on the chat room, so feel free to engage that way. And um, as Bernie just said, of course, we'll stay and have a discussion afterward. Um, also, I wanted to let everyone know that we have extended the series by two more readings. There'll be a reading on Thursday, September 3rd, and there'll be a reading on Saturday, September 12th. So that last reading will be on a Saturday, also same time, 4 p.m. Eastern time. But a lot of us are teaching at the Thursday slot, so we've had to change it to Saturday. And we'll put up the list of readers for all of the things that are coming up on the um, on the website and just uh, on the Facebook website and just update that. Um, for next week, the 20th, it is uh, Mary will be being our introducer, Marcella Duran, Daniel Eltringham, Morgan Grace Willow, Heather Levinson, Tom McGuire, Cole Swenson, and Kathy Weld. So that's next week. Okay. I couldn't help notice this week, I was really amazed at the notion of systems that seemed to come out a lot. We had, of course, the three people focusing on water systems with Tacey and Brenda and Linda. I thought that was a great coincidence. But then I was also really struck by, for instance, Laney's system of detail. And it seemed to me that the, there was a lot going on with that. Uh, Keith's system of sciences, the way these sciences, and I must admit, I got a little bit, you know, sort of super uh, attentive to it, but like the system of the backyard, uh, it just seemed to be uh, a real theme that floated to the surface. And I, I don't know if, you know, it just seems like such an important element of uh ecological attention is to think about systems and how uh, they work together or don't. A call? Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to say a little bit about the poem that I read, speaking of systems. And the poem was about, was written when New York State hadn't yet decided whether or not there was going to be a moratorium on fracking. And so, and at the same time that this battle over fracking is going on in upstate New York, where I'm at in Woodstock, um, 
surrounded by, you know, New York City drinking water. Um, there was also a great privatization of local creeks and, and so on, like, you know, suddenly being denied access, access to, to water. And the question of, yeah, critique of systems, absolutely. But, yeah, Rachel. Unmute. Oh, I'm on mute. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I think I unmuted. You unmuted me. I see. Oh. Oops. Press. Thank you, everybody, for being patient with two seconds of delay. Uh, I was very interested in how talk about systems in some people's work seem to go with a certain kind of poetics of observation, a, a straight shooting of, of not too much fancy, fancy stuff, factual imagery, what I'd call almost objectivist, um, and a verbal clarity without too much affect. Uh, that's a strange way of saying it, without too much um, fussing affect or and that just interested me so much at the same time that a lot of people in general in this in this range of um, materials actually were extremely unbelievably elegiac which means that the there's a poetry system behind that that expects certain things from elegy which is not clear that Elegy can now deliver since elegy usually goes to transcendence and um, you know the the dead the dead item the dead person usually becomes uplifted to the stars and now becomes a consolation or something of that sort in very traditional and there's um, unfortunately while people are verbally you know smart actual uh, promises of uplift are few and far between. And if I can just put a codicil on um, John, John's reading, the second reader, um, just to acknowledge the system, it's Audrey Lord who said the master's tools will never, um, ex uh, yeah. well, the master's house, I just, uh, what, what was the master's tools will never, I can't remember now the exact quotation. But destroy the master's house. Destroy, destroy the master's house. Okay. And I think, you know, you're very good about telling who did it, but must have left Audrey Lord out. But the other two are real points. Uh, Jonathan, do you have your hand up? No. I wanted to, Sorry. Cole, I wanted to ask Linda Russo, um, I found, what is it, Creek or Poetics you called it? Creek or Poetics. Yeah, just. Oh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes. I wanted to ask you the location again. Uh, I think you actually described it in the poem. Um, I found it very affecting. I just wanted to find out the location oh, of your okay. creek. Okay. Oh, so well, I've been writing with, I mean, there's many creeks, but um, this particular creek is, um, I'm in Pullman, Washington. It's near the border with Idaho. Um, um, and the region is called the Palouse. It's a high desert native prairie region. Um, it's a native prairie biome that's been um, converted to agriculture, um, industrial agricultural lands. So um, there's a lot of prairie remnants and, um, you know, the creeks, um, the part of the, uh, to me, part of the remnant of this, this land, um, you know, pre-settlement. Pre um, yeah, so that's what that's about. I mean, the Creco, it was, I was just sort of playing. I know, it, I, I, I know. I just wanted to know the, um, and what, what, can you spell Palouse? Is that it for me? Palouse is P-A-L-O-U-S-E. Um, okay. It's a, it's just a uh, Word. hilly, you know, region that's been completely converted to agriculture, uh, wheat and lentils. Um, and it's, uh, it's been called the Tuscany of Eastern Washington, if you can believe it. A lot of people photograph here. Oh. Um, 
But, you know, just kind of bring it back around to this idea of, I mean, the systems and the material. I mean, I feel like there was a lot of materiality in what was yeah. um, being said today. I was I was stuck by struck by the all the wrists and the body parts, um, you know, always bringing us back to the embodiedness. Um, I mean, if, if we're going to write in these larger natural and unnatural or cult, natural cultural systems, I think it makes a lot of sense that to bring, um, to bring bodies in and, you know. Yeah. I think uh, at city, is that how you pronounce your name? Was it you who mentioned the finger, the finger legs? And, no, it was John. It was John. Who was it? It was McCorkle. James. Oh, James. Okay. Yeah. Bearing out your point. I was, I, I kind of wanted to ask um, Tacey a little bit more about, I mean, some of the thing, you know, the water and there was this, the knuckles and the wrists and, um, there's, there was, um, a lot of, um, I guess a lot of the body parts I felt that, um, or I, I caught that, um, you mentioned Tacey were very like bony and, and mineral in the water. So, um, could you talk a, a little bit about, um, oh, and the body was very fluid at times too. Um, so, and I, and I think that for me was a theme throughout these different pieces when our, when our bodies in in parts or even part of the mineral world and when our when our bodies um you know separate sure so um rain skull um was i wrote it when i was in uh, my mfa at cornell university living in ithaca and um i spent a lot of time in the gorges just because um you know i had come from the desert and it was difficult for me to um, not be able to see the sunrise or the sunset or to see past the trees. Or um, So I found a lot of solace in the gorges. And um, there is also where, mm. um, sorry, I have like 20 different things I'm trying to think about and I'm trying to remember about the body too, sorry. Um, but a lot of... Um, what I gather and in my writing and everything, um, it ties back to the land and the stories that are embodied in the land. Um, and so there are places for me that I travel or that I live that hold, you know, these stories and, um, and even my own body, right? My own body has stories of, of different things that I've gone through and that, that hold uh, certain stories in them. And so, um, yeah, I, there was, a, there was a, a little anecdote that I wanted to say, and now I can't remember what it is. The older you get, the less you can remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. um, but, but I was, I did want to say that, um, that somehow like the wrist has just been this reoccurring, um, theme in my work especially the wrist and and I I'm not exactly sure why it just it's just kind of manifesting itself and um and so anyway yeah that's something that I've I've kind of been thinking on and musing on so um yeah Casey could I ask you um as I was listening to your poem I was hearing collective trauma and then you came to some words that were similar to that. And I was wondering if you could speak to Echo Poetics as a, a collective more than individual experience in your work. Yeah, so uh, even I feel like there's like a range that you can take for um, – even in like one individual wrist or one individual space. And um, for, for our people, um, I'm Navajo and we call ourselves Dine. And so, like I said, you know, these stories are held um, within the land and we work together as systems and not only, um, not only like 
current people, but our ancestors, right? Those, those systems are not only in the land, but they're in our bodies. And so every part of who I am is a part of their system. Does that, I don't know if that makes sense. Like every, everyone that I come from is part of me. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so in that way we have shared blood, shared stories, shared systems or ecosystems and how we, um, how they've contributed to me and then how I will contribute to my posterity. Um, and then how I work within my own Diné people, my own family, my own, um, community. And I'm, I, I move fair kind of often. And so, you know, there's always room for, um, change and trying to see how we fit in together as, as people in systems. I was, I just started my PhD here at uh, Florida State University and I just relocated last week. Um, but we took, I, I did my summer term and um, we were talking about, uh, darn, I can't remember what his name was, um, but he had this article talking about the ecosystems and how people are affected within them in terms of um, academia. And I remembered this um, little video that I had seen on social media about the reintroduction of wolves into uh, Yellowstone. And I don't know, maybe some of you have seen that um, where, you know, as, as, as a system, Yellowstone um, and the people who run it had set up essentially what they didn't realize was an ecosystem that got into them to the point of attrition. Um, they didn't realize that they had gotten themselves to that point. And so until they had reintroduced the wolves um, into that area and then um, they ate off, a lot of the wolves started to hunt the deer, which moved, you know, it just shifted everything around. And um, anyway, so I, I kind of see um, myself, right? Um, and then peoples and communities and how, how we interact, we, we all influence one another. And in Navajo, we have what we call keh, which in some of you might know more um, with the Lakota, they call it um, mitakia oyasin, which means we are all related, which means that we all affect one another in some way, whether it's a good way or a bad way. Um, but anyway, I hope that answered your question, sorry. I see. I just wanted to say how much I loved your lines that um, you would come bearing um, mountains on your shoulders and lakes around your ankles, which shows such a personal relationship um, with the land and the sense of of lifting it up and caring for it. So thank you for those lines. Yes, thank you. I, I feel like, um, you know, um, any new area, I, my, my nephew came with us here to Tallahassee, and he's, he's uh, seven years old. And, you know, coming from the desert into a very, I, I, it feels like a jungle, honestly, you know, all around my home, it's very green. And there's new sounds and everything. And I told him, I said, um, we went on a little hike, just north of here. And I told him, I said, you have to be careful with the land. I said, we don't know the land here and the land doesn't know us. And you can't just run out and think that you're going to be okay. I said, you have to learn to respect the land, introduce yourself, tell, tell them who you are, and then tread lightly until you get to know the land. So um, I'm excited for work that's going to come from here as I get to know the land here, but I'll definitely miss my own land back home. Mm. I was um, really struck, Tacey, in your, your work by particularly the, the second half and the last piece, um, the use of a constant we. And so it's getting back to Sarah's point about the collectivity. And I thought it was an interesting contrast with uh, Lainey, with your piece, where we were so focused on detail and building a, I was really aware of the system of detail that seemed to 
be free of pronoun. And, and so a collectivity that was achieved through a really different means. And I wondered if you would talk about that a little bit with, uh, and I'm going to pick up on Rachel's uh, notion of the objective observation, the, the crisp, tiny, uh, real objectness. Yeah, I'm really appreciating this conversation. I was also struck by that word collectivity. And um, in this work that I'm reading from, um, Practice Has No Sequel, which is a sequel to my book, Practice, it's, it's really all about trying to be in the present moment and how contemplative practice can enable us to... Um, feel or, or understand in an embodied way, not just an intellectual way, that separation is illusion. Separation is illusion. And so when we go out into the world and try to affect whatever change we want to affect, if we're feeling disconnected from ourselves and each other, that has a less positive impact potentially. Um, then when we are able to be, I think it's just about remembering for me. How do I remember um, all the time? I mean, the aspiration is to remember all the time that separation is illusion. So in other words, an idea that if I'm okay and somebody else isn't, that's not okay because separation, because there's no difference. And so when we see ourselves as part of the world, not just as an idea, but um, I don't know if this is making sense. I guess it's, it's aspirational towards having an interior connectivity to self and to world so that we're, we're always seeing ourselves as in relationship to each other and our world and the physical world but it's beginning not with looking out first, but looking in first and trying to pause um, and come back into that space of um, that we're always connected, that we're always collective, that my, my actions affect others, you know, um, how I walk on the earth or don't or you know, choices are not, the idea that choices are just individual is not true, in my opinion. And so I'm trying to get there, um, going, going, starting with contemplative practice as a, as a beginning point to enable that, those connections to be always present is the hope. I do thinking thinking of Lainey's comment there about um, uh, disconnectedness or connectedness, and um, the way Rachel was thinking previously uh, about the objectivity or the facticity of the poems, the clear attention to detail. Um, so I'm throwing in a lot of names here as well. But just the other day, I was listening also to uh, Cole's. Uh, uh, cross-cultural poetics interview in which uh, Cole speaks about the uh, difference in activism of poetics between say Mark Nowak's poet poetics which is a direct call to activism uh, Cole's collection ours um, which is more of a, a slow burn motive towards action in some way and I'm wondering how the poets feel about um, uh, particularly the systemic nature of this poetry, thinking about systems, uh, that clear attention to detail, um, how the uh, the world or the observation of the world um, interrelates with the language used, uh, the position of the speaker with that, and how all of these constellate to create a poetics of facticity. And uh, is it like, is the fact of the poetics the actual act of observation? And is that what it teaches us? Or what what is this nexus of things that's going on here? If that's a fair question. A great question. And I'll bet there are a lot of people who, given you know, just a moment to reflect, will have a lot to contribute to that. It's interesting, we've touched 
A few times in our discussions on this notion of facticity, and it feels this week to me to be much more tied to this notion of observation. And I think of observation in terms of a kind of bearing witness and the kind of inclusivity that is inherent in bearing witness. I just want to say, I think, I think it is, you know, the act of observation is important, but it's definitely, you know, motivated by an ethics of what it's important to pay attention to. Um, and so, you know, where, where does, where does that come from? And, you know, how, maybe how are, we, I mean, you mentioned activism. So maybe how are, you know, how can we activate whatever our poetic lenses to um, direct some streams of attention into things um, that don't get attention. Anyway, that's part of what my my project is about. But um, I was struck. Yeah, I'll answer. I, you know, I wanted to ask Brenda a question, but maybe she was already going to speak to um, your question, Alec. So. I wonder if I could throw in um, the water drought thing into the conversation there, because it seems like, um, you know, a collective gathers around a resource like water, which connects us, but then we are divided by uh, the politics of that water and how it gets used and there are upstream uses, downstream uses. And it seems that the environmental humanities in particular are so um, excited by the blue figure, the figure of the blue, the blue marble in the sky, there's this thing now called the blue humanities, you know, so when we, when we, when we think climate change, we think oceans, we think melting glaciers, we think sea level rise, <clears throat> we think hurricanes, we think flood, we think storm surge. But then what's, what about the flip side of that? What's connected to that is drought, right? And uh, for, for many people on the planet, you know, what, what is, what is, a flood for one population is going to be a drought for another population. And I was struck by the number of readings today that were connecting to drought, perhaps just by fact of a sort of desert landscape that I share with Tacey, I'm from New Mexico. So, uh, you know, identified with your sense of place, uh, James, your evocation of the upper Sonoran desert, Linda, the, the Palouse, uh, John, uh, is that John Brandy? Who read? Was it John Brandy? Because John Brandy, I know, has lived in the desert. <laughs> but then, then uh, Brenda Cultus's, you know, sort of investigation of the pollution of water and a lot. So the sense of elegy as loss of connection to or access to clean water, but also loss of water. I mean, drought. I guess I was wondering: is is there a poetics of drought? Is there a kind of ethics of drought? Is there a figure of drought? I, I was supervising a, a, a student and she wanted to write about the wasteland in terms of drought. T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. We could find a lot of essays on flood. We could find a lot of essays on sort of eco-critical essays on blue humanities, on water, but there's very little out there on drought, actually. I was struck by James McCorkle's comment, desert is not a singularity. And, and that seems to be um, directly pointing to this, that it's it's not a single thing. It's a again a complex, and obviously desert and drought are constructing each other all the time. Do you want to talk about that, James? At all uh, the the whole idea too of the migration, I thought was really uh, important in terms of the occupation of that desert. Um, first off, um, I apologize that my screen sharing completely. <coughs> baffled me so um yeah the, the more I, I have studied it um if you will um the more in, in a sense um the desert is just the opposite of how we think of a of a desert and that's probably obvious to just about everyone there it's such a um it, it occupies a completely different time frame and um, I think in a different reading a um, couple of weeks ago, um, maybe it was Petra Coopers who mentioned the idea of time and duration. And I think that's a really interesting um, way of re 
reframing much of what we're talking about and and um the fluidity of water seems to occupy one form of time but the desert or the fragility of the desert with its uh really thin crusts of soil that takes millennia in, in many ways to build and in a sense it's a whole network much like uh, uh a northwestern fungi that is growing under under acres and acres of of uh, of woodland. Um, it's a whole whole network of a, a living organism um, that's easily disturbed or, or ruptured. Um, so I'm interested in different forms of time. Um, I also like to just well, I have a, a moment to think about observation. One of the pro one of the issues in the project that Gabriella and I have been working on in this book is the idea of observation as surveillance. Um, you know, in poetics, it's, um, you know, lyric, it's always observation in this kind of uh, seeking affinity. But um, I'm in front of this computer that also uh, cut out on me just after I finished reading. So I lost Linda's. Um, um, reading, unfortunately, but you know, to what degree are we um, really participating in a surveillance culture? Obviously, we talk about that all the time, but here, our own our own way of looking at each other um, becomes more and more problematic. I'm kind of rambling, but those are some thoughts. Another complication to observation, I think, has to do with information, right? And that. But ecopoetics has an obligation, or much ecopoetics has an obligation to information so that, for instance, James, your work, when you're citing the, the data, the location of these particular remains, that comes from some kind of research, I presume, right? And Brenda's work comes from research, too, so that observation is no longer, you know, in the, in the sort of tradition of the lyric it's not everything you can gather when you get on your computer and start to explore when you when you are engaged in a more documentary poetics um, and it seems to me that part of a lot of eco poetics is moving beyond firsthand observation because of a recognition of obligation to what kinds of knowledge we can access uh, uh, beyond what our own eyes can uh, can see yeah. But I also, if I can just say one other thing that I think about this whole thing about systems is that systems allow for movement across scale, uh, which is something that we saw in a lot of the work that we uh, were listening to today. And scale is such an important uh, preoccupation in a lot of eco-poetics, right, because of our awareness of, for instance, the shifting place of the human and, you know, an awareness of deep time and all that. And I think this, it's not surprising that we see a lot of interest in systems when they are a way to move from the particular to something larger, or for that matter, to move from water in one form to drought, you know, to water, the presence of water to the absence of water uh, or the movement of water uh, you know, through a kind of systems thought. And it seems to me a wonderful broadening of poetics that is encouraged by uh, eco, you know, environmental thought to be to have a, holding systems in mind. Yeah. I was thinking with the drought issue, the way drought is also its own system and ignites a whole uh, network of actions and things, but also just the notion, the phenomenon of lack. And obviously, you know, the lack and abundance, flood and um, storms, etc. the overabundance of one place, but lack and the way lack creates lack, drought creates lack of food, um, Mm -hmm. creates lack of stability and so the whole way that lack as a category is getting foregrounded yeah i was going to just mention back to lynn with in great agreement that that's a little bit why uh, i was trying to talk about the question of a poetry 
of poetry as a closed system that we think we know what poetry is and we've done it you know in various ways we've taught it it has a certain dimension that uh, of things to do in poetry which gets really changed um, more than a little by the languages of of documentary the languages of certain kinds of observation and what what that means is that does that um, bring about or try to um, open the question of a, really a new poetics, which we keep on flirting with talking about, but it's very hard to do. And I don't, that's not a critique of what, where we've been. Um, but the, the notion of a poetics, which is Joan Ritalik's very important phrase, that it's not, she doesn't talk about it specifically he, in this context, but it's important to consider what that would be and what kind of languages would be would be better ways or not better ways, or is that a stupid, really dumb remark? Because all languages presumably can function for us in poetry. It's just a question of what proportion and how that how that gets. Um, assimilated into the actual work, which means, again, the notion of what literature is, what language do we use, and so on, gets all mixed up with this without necessarily being separable. And that's one of the, the interesting dimensions of all of this discussion. A lot of us don't say language. We're saying other things. And we don't say, um, like, poetry as an institution, but we're using both of those concepts as background to almost everything we say, just, just saying. And how can a use of language take information right. farther than just informing? That's what I mean. Yeah. It's yeah. kind of like Jane Hirschfeld said about, we've got to remember that poetry um, speaks to the stomach. To the into the heart, and uh, one of the sound system, one of the systems we haven't talked about are sound systems, um, at least today. And what struck me um, for all the observational and um, and measurable quantitative um, moments in the poems, um, there was real music today. Um, it was the the poems were singing to me. Um, and that's and, not, and I'm not saying um, that all poetry has to be song, but um, there was um, in each distinctive voice um, a real musical quality. Um, and one of the phrases that uh, struck me in particular, um, I think it came up twice or maybe three times, was this notion of the sound of running water. Mm -hmm. um, I loved. I, lo I think that Astati, you use that phrase the ceremony of running water. Um, and I heard it once or another, another time, maybe from Linda. It was those were gorgeous lines. Uh, am I, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so, hi everybody. And this conversation, <laughs> this isn't uh, an analytical statement, but this conversation is making me really happy and really sad simultaneously, uh, as have the other ones the past few weeks, because people are, are really dealing with things that are so difficult to deal with. So it's, it, um, and questioning them in not just a superficial way about what language we might use. And I think that Tacey's poem was an example of almost another kind of language in a sense. And I'm not sure yet what I mean by that, but, and this is probably gonna sound racist and maybe it is, but her poetry or Casey, your poetry seemed to me to be so much closer to the body, in your body and the body as connected to nature than so much poetry that I hear and the word choice was quite different too. I'd like to look at it and find out what I mean by that. And also, I remember some of you know Elliot Weinberger. He was an old poetry friend of mine. And I remember asking him maybe 35 years ago, 
so what do you think uh, the poetry of the 21st century is going to be? And he said, it's not going to be in English. <laughs> it's going to be <laughs> from, from other countries, you know, uh, we're done. And I hope we're not done, but uh, um, there's so much that we have taken for granted that um, it's a good thing that the language poets ask certain questions and that we continue to investigate these things. It's so important. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's about language. I mean, I'm, I'm going to kind of go out on a limb here and say, you know, with regard to Ruth's question, I don't think it's so much racist as how people of different heritages are, um, our different cultures have a relationship to language and to the exactly. land. Right. That's why, you know, when when I go to the when I go to think about water, you know, I went to the uh, Clean Water Act and, you know, and then in English, it's all it's a it's a legislative language. It's all about, you know, well, what is a water of the U.S.? What isn't a water of the U.S.? Like I am, you know, in a way as a as this subject kind of prohibited from, you know, <laughs> claiming that kind of Bodied relationship to the water because my legal system has or my educational system has done everything to keep me from, you know, from saying like, you know, Natalie Diaz does and, you know, Tasty too. this like, well, I am the water. Right. And when in English, when we try to say that, we have to say, well, the human body is 70 percent water. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I know it's a serious question. What do we do about that? Because if we're honest, we can't incorporate things that incorporate, no pun intended, you know, things that don't come from the system that we come from. I don't want to appropriate someone else's understanding. I want to yeah. honor it, but I, I don't want to have to only speak through the yeah. kind of, you know, what is it? Certain kinds of observations or what, what, what's, what can qualify as research in, you know, when we're trying to, you know, cross that boundary that uh, we settler colonial, you know, Western understandings have constructed. How are we going to cross that boundary to deconstruct that understanding? So I'm, I, I guess, I'm really interested in the, you know, the return of empirical research to poetry. Uh, well, I don't. It's not even a return, but where does it remain in the realm of empirical research, and where does it then become lyric again? And then it gets devalued, you know, in some schools and some strains of eco poetry that gets devalued as, you know, naive or, you know, not uh, theoretical. So there, I, I put it out there. Exactly. Thank you. For may, that. I, may, I, may I say something? Yes. I'm, a, I'm a Spanish poet from Spain. And although language is extremely important, in the connection of one language to to the environment. I think even more so is culture. I think in Latin America, Spanish changes so much because of many peoples bringing to the language their experience with their environment. So for example, a native people or indigenous people Changes the Spanish totally. They bring many of their uh, of their words into Spanish, words that we don't have in Spanish, and we accept that. Also, people from Africa, many many uh, words now in Spanish talking about religion, or uh, because they brought many words from their own religions come from African words. So I think we have to be open, maybe. This is from a Spanish poet. My language is Spanish, obviously, but maybe English should be open to bringing Navajo uh, words into the English language to express what is happening now with many of the uh, ecosystem. Because maybe not, uh, many of the native people understand better this uh, land. That because we as people who are, were color, co people who colonized, maybe we are still, our language is still not part of the land. Do, I don't know if I, I explained myself. I'm sorry if I didn't. Yeah, I think you did a, a good job of explaining. Thank you. 
could I, am I unmuted? Yes, yes. Could I, or am I heavy breathing? <laughs> I wanted to say simply that we all appropriate all the time, and that sometimes, you know, sometimes it's an unethical appropriation, and we have to self-reflect, but everyone is always appropriating, and that's in part called education. <laughs> how do you learn to read of a person who is not of your culture? How did um, how how did I learn to read African American poetry when I wanted to learn how to read it? I had to fucking read it, okay? And I had to look into what people were trying to say about it, and I tried to educate myself the way they try to educate students about. And so everyone is always taking. It's a question of also maybe giving and also being humble and also um, not doing unethical appropriation, which is a judgment call that you make on yourself and maybe on other people, you know, that's, that's all. I mean, I, I, I think there's a moment when you, when you have to acknowledge that you're actually learning something from other people. And that's all, you know. That's and then, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic what you're saying. What, what about from uh, learning from other than humans? I mean, to bring the system yes. back into this. So one, one of the systems is alphabetic literacy. Okay. And, uh, you know, I think part of, for me, what's been really important to Ecopoetics is expanding our sense of what a text is, right? So we learn to read the landscape. We, 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 we acquire eco-literacy. We don't just like, you know, as, for the 747 poets who come in, you know, to Hawaii and write a poem, throw some bird names into it, you know, and publish it in the New Yorker. And it's like their wonderful vacation in Hawaii. Um, we don't do 747 poetry, but but a text is also an oral text, right? So I'm thinking of Ophelia Zepeda, a Tohono O'odham poet, whose poetry comes across as very sort of simplistic and childlike in English. And I don't know or speak Tohono O'odham, but there are some wonderful bilingual editions of her work. She also wrote a Papago Grammar. But there's also an edition that includes a CD of her reading the poems. You know, so when we have the oral text, it complicates the, the written text, and then we have the two languages interacting. You know, what are we up to with these readings here? But, um, but one, one thing that we become attuned to, I think, when we, when we become more literate, you know, whether it be ecologically or textually, is we, we attune to the histories of words. So for example, where I grew up, a sequia, you know, is the word for an irrigation system in, in northern New Mexico. It's the system that the Spanish brought that superseded the permaculture system that was there before that was invisible to them, in fact. I was in North Africa not too long ago in Morocco, and I was astonished to hear that word, a sequia. I was like, oh, the Spanish got it from North Africa, from Africa. So that word traveled with that travel, mm -hmm. you know, so different practices traveled. And uh, so, you know, there's a sense in which landscapes have history, like words have history. For me, ecopoetics can be about uh, learning to read, extending one's, expanding one's sense of literacy in ways which I think all the poems that were read today really did marvelously. Hey, I also think there's a, a danger generally in homogenizing or considering the English language as a homogenous thing. Um, like, especially if we think of dialects or um, uh, particularly the Northumbrian dialect or the Northern dialect in England, which root, has roots back with the Northumbrian uh, dialect of Old English, which has heavy inflections from Norse society or Old Norse as opposed to Old French. And when all of these things come in, like if you follow the uh, different words that we have for ice and fire, so many of those can be followed back to uh, the Old Norse roots, which have a different language for ice and fire, which are also of landscape and things like that. And it feels as though like it's, um, th there's something fruitful within uh, the etymologies of our language and the, the points of deviation or the points of influx that could uh, even within an English language, um, give us some sensibility to alternate historical or historically grounded um, ways of thinking about language in relation to place and landscape. Uh, and, 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 and in Old Norse um, uh, mythology, uh, Odin uh, stole the mead of poetry from the um, dragon Satunga, 
and the word for dragon in Old Norse was uh, worm. And so in two ways, then, the Old Norse mythology teaches us of a, a, a way of thinking of the more than human, both in the supernatural sense or supernatural sense with the Satunga, the dragon, but also the way that worm is equ equitable to dragon. And worm was also what was considered that which brought disease. Worms of disease were what brought disease. And it feels as though by thinking back into different mythologies, might in some way reveal to us ways of thinking about the historical or the mythological interconnectedness of the human and the more than human and the beyond human in fruitful ways that seem so present to now as well, um, at least to my, to my eyes and ears. I'm thinking of um, not only historically such a complex of you know, conglomeration, as you say, English is far from a single thing, but also just the different Englishes that are spoken today in different places. And it's not just accent, obviously, it is vocabulary based on the needs of a specific place, uh, it's traditions that seep in from other cultures around it, New Zealand English and South African English, you know, it's miles and miles apart. So to remember that and to think about how that can be put into a kind of formal practice, that sort of difference to expand formal possibilities. I, I wanted to get back to um, Lynn's mentioning of the information and stretching it and Thomas McGuire's mentioning of the lyric and, and thinking about how simply lyricism might help information to break apart, to lose its kind of monolithic, a piece of information comes in often like a little nugget. And to use lyricism in the expressing of that information in a way that erodes it, that breaks it open, um, uh, and gets to some of the expansion that, that Rachel, you were talking about. Right. I was thinking about that also in relation to, um, Tacey, what you were saying about the radical difference of these pieces once they get translated into English and how much of that is simply that the lyric tenor is changed so much. The object that is the poem is, is changed so much, the sonic object. Mm. You know, so I think some of you are in that anthology it's an anthology of hybrid women's poetry. I can't think of the name, but it's a combat. Women like Fanny Howe's in there, for instance, who, who use a lyric voice, but also innovative language based upon things like language poetry. I don't know how to characterize it exactly. Are some of you in that? Does anybody want to say anything about it? Maybe. That? Huh? Can't hear you. Can't hear you. Lainey Brown, I think, was one of the editors of at least one oh, of those okay. anthologies. <laughs> right, Lainey? I think she's, I think it's a different anthology being referred to, right? I, um, not the uh, I'll Drown My Book, but different one. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're almost to six o'clock. So, um, last things that we want to say, um, huge issues we want to bring up and then <laughs> carry over to next week. Yeah. Okay. Was that, by the way, I just, was it that poet, was it American Women Poets in the 21st Century where lyric meets language? Is that the one, Ruth? No, uh, okay. I think the word hybrid is in the title, but thanks for, yeah. I can't remember. Yeah. Is that, is that your anthology call? American Hybrid? No. Oh. I don't, I don't think so. I think this, it sounds like this is more where the pieces themselves are hybrid and yeah. incorporating different yeah. kinds of, of formal properties. 
Well, when, when you remember it, tell us next week. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Cole. Thank you so much. Well, th thanks, everyone, for coming. We'll see you again next week. And um, good week to everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank, you, Thank you for the readings. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, everybody. Bye.